I think there's 22. You have to know. Lincoln's a Republican. Johnson's a Democrat. Just for that one election, it was the union. Yes, you will have to do that. We have two other vice presidents. No, we just have another president. But Lincoln's assassinated, so Johnson will become the president. So that's how we have to know more. All you have to know is the president. Just not the years, just the last name and the party. That's it. And their hats. I keep on forgetting the hats. Huh? Yeah, the Friday before. There's a test the Friday before? No, we just do the, the president's. Oh, okay. Then the semester test will be even better every day the semester test. Wednesday of that week, I think. So, there's McClellan trying to bring the country together, but everybody knew, no, it will end the war. Yeah. So does the South have election? The South already had their election for Jefferson, they elected Jefferson Davis in 1862. Who will save the country? Everybody believed McClellan would win. In the U.S. as we know it, it's not. In fact, Lincoln was positive he would lose. He even wrote a letter to give to McClellan after the election. He went to do it now while he was still in sound mind, not just totally distraught. And in this letter he said, together we must try to reunify the country before your inauguration. Because we both know once you're inaugurated, the Confederacy will win. He was going to give to McClellan, he sealed it, put it in his desk, and waited. Everybody Every observer believed McClellan would win. The Confederacy is going to still pull this thing out. A totally different course of history. Lincoln was absolutely depressed. It's over. Who will save the country? What one person will save the United States? Who? Who? <laughs> Who? Calhoun. He died. Huh? He never really he never did die. die. He died. That was his grave. 1850. Calhoun is gone, people. He's gone. He can't save the country. Why didn't you understand that? Who might else save the country? I know what you're thinking. <laughs> Raul? No. Raul, he's made up. He's not a real person. He can't save the country. Why did you have that stuff on? How would you know that? By the way, glasses, neck hair, he's a little heavier, he's got a ring. <laughs> Who's going to save the country? The obvious choice Jefferson Davis. <laughs> I actually <laughs> Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, hated Joseph E. Johnson, thought he wasn't aggressive enough, and fired him right at the end of August. There's only a couple months of the election. They could have hold out just another month and a half. It probably would have won. McClellan would have won. Yeah. He fired who? Johnston, the Confederate commander in front of Atlanta. Wait, I thought that Johnson was Jefferson. Johnson. Johnson was the Confederate in front of Atlanta. Sherman was the Union. Why are you firing? He wanted somebody more aggressive. He he wanted someone to counterattack. He didn't like the fact that Johnson just kept, Johnson just kept pulling back. What if there was like if they could just need to survive and allow the In fact, Lee told him this was a terrible mistake. And his bigger mistake was the guy he picked, because you're exactly right. As it would turn out, he picked John Bell Hood. Why Hood? By the way, that sad face guy right there. Hey, I think he already had that face, but he lost a leg at Second Bull Run and an arm at Gettysburg. Oh, oh, yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah, but he's a you know, general. He knew only one thing attack. Much more aggressive than Lee was. And so he got his army. He's outnumbered nearly two to one at the gates of Atlanta. And what did he do? In a series of battles, we call the Battle of Atlanta, three big battles. 
He counterattacked. And guess what happened to his army? A quarter of it, a third of it would be gone in two weeks. He destroyed his army. And then he would, he would have no choice but to give up Atlanta and retreat. Sherman marched into Atlanta, and it was just like everything changed overnight. It went from, we can never win this war, to, it's almost over. It is amazing what a big deal it was. And another city that had been trying, the Union had been trying to take for six months, all of a sudden, in a naval operation that surprised everybody, just two weeks after Atlanta fell in Hood, Mobile, Alabama fell. To David Farragut. Remember Farragut's the admiral who took the Commodore, now an admiral, who took New Orleans. His fleet sailed in to Mobile Bay, past the Confederate defenses. Now the Confederates were using the this at Charleston Harbor too. Imagine a really big barrel filled with gunpowder. They would put tin over it and solder it to make it relatively waterproof, and then they would anchor them under the water on sea legs. Then using an electronic fuse that worked maybe a tenth of the time, but hopefully a ship would go over it and then they would explode. They sunk a couple Union ships with these. They had these all over Mobile Bay. Anybody know what they're called? They didn't want those same mines, but actually they didn't call them mines then. Torpedoes. And torpedoes today, they're not self propelled, but they hit under the water line. So. Farragut ships started going in, a few of these torpedoes went off, and a couple of the captains of ships started slowing down. And Farragut sent his order by flag, his famous order to keep going. Does anybody know? Damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. And that's, have you ever heard that? It comes from Mobile Bay. Damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. They were fighting against a Confederate ironclad called the Tennessee. And they were, Farragut's flagship, the Hartford, which was a wooden hulled ship, they were six feet apart, blazing away each other. Farragut, who got vertigo, didn't want to collapse on the ship, so he had himself lashed on the rigging over the ship. He's hanging out over it. He's tied his leg and arm, tied for the whole battle, as the Confederates are firing from me to the wall away. They were of a different breed. <laughs> Farragut, that's a combination of incredibly brave and tough men. Yeah, just totally crazy. But that kind of bravery, wow. Farragut, they would take Mobile. If you go to Washington, D.C., Farragut Square, there would be named after one of the most famous squares in D.C. And go there, I highly recommend it. I know James has been there, anybody else? <laughs> Did you go to Farragut Square? There's a subway stop. Yeah, well, it's, it's right there at Farragut Square, yeah. isn't it? Yes. And, you know, this really famous general, really good restaurants there. What's the most important thing? Food. Food. <laughs> Food. <laughs> so, after Mobile and Atlanta, but especially Atlanta, but Mobile was kind of like the icing on the cake, Lincoln would be reelected. Who did the blue states vote for? Hmm. They're Confederate. <laughs> Now, McClellan only, only lost. I mean, 400,000 votes was a lot then, but still, just one turn. And McClellan still could have won this. It was that close. Yeah. Um, how fast did it take to figure out who was president? It's like today, you know, like, right, as on election day. So, like, back then, because, like, how many votes, so how did that get considered? They, they, they knew pretty sure by the next day. By the afternoon of the next day, then, because Telegraph would get the information pretty quickly. And there was a Telegraph line connecting here. But just like today, once you do the electoral, they do the math, once you get a majority the electoral college. And so they probably knew that morning. The morning after, so the morning after, which is still pretty fast. And you remember it's electoral college, and so they didn't have a congressman yet. They created Nevada for the specific reason to vote Republican in this election. They were scared they might not get enough electoral votes. I mean, it's kind of funny. Montana was just made a territory, but they couldn't vote yet. Remember, this is all electoral college. And big deal, my favorite cartoon of the world. Now, I love this one. 
This is him with the election totals. It is from Harper's Magazine, so they draw him really tall. I just think that is awesome. Pure it's rights and good draw hands. Hands are hard. I mean, I, you want me to draw one for you? Like my mom? So, yes, I know. All right. Hood escaped, and what he tried to do is attack Nashville and cut off Sherman's defensive line. And the Battle of Nashville, after the election, hey, once the election happened, it's over. Nashville, Hood destroyed his army. The Army of the West for the Confederacy ended at Nashville. This was one of the most decisive victories of the Civil War. Hood's army was destroyed. It was the Rock of Chickamauga in charge of the Union forces. Thomas, yeah. Wait, so why did Hood go to Nashville? He thought he could cut off Sherman's supply line into Atlanta. It was actually a, a desperate, desperate measure, and his army would be gone. Why would you go fight a general? Like, they already Well, no one wants to quit yet. And you're going to find this out in war, even though you know the war is over. The other side just won't quit. And a lot of times the killing gets worse and worse and gets more horrific. And it seems counterintuitive. I mean, it's really noticeable. You really see it in World War II. Really see it there. But it happened here too. Well, Sherman came up with a tactic. It's an old tactic. But what he decided to do was this. We call it today total war. And let me explain what all my little kind of comments here is. So I just before anything else, I don't forget to say it. War. What the deal was is this. They couldn't win the war on the battlefield. I mean, they've won victories, but the Confederacy keeps fighting. If you can't win it on the battlefield, where do you take the war? We call that in the 20th century, or exactly right, we call it the home front. Which seems would have made no sense before the Industrial Revolution. So, can't win the war on the battlefield, go to their homes. And that means everyone is a combatant. A combatant is somebody at war. Normally, the combatants are like soldiers, right? No, it means every single person on the enemy side is a combatant. And by the way, if you think that about your enemy, they think that about you. And they become legitimate targets of war. Now, the most basic reason you do it is for industry. Hey, if they can't produce the goods of war in a modern economy, they have to quit. If you don't have guns, you quit, right? Or another way to look at it, too, is transportation, which is tied to industry. You can't get the goods to the front. But there's another logic to it. And they would say a thing that kind of sanitizes it a bit, but it's called break the enemy's will. They want to make the people back home suffer so much that they make their governments quit. So you take the word of the enemy and you make them suffer. When I mean suffer, I mean starve, deprive them of their homes, make their life miserable, kill and maim their families and their friends. That is total war. You make life so horrible for them back at home, they force the government to quit fighting. And so put a big, like a bracket or something, and put next to it, it's politics. This is a political function. War, politics. Nobody wins the battle on some great titanic victory on the battlefield. It's a political will. You break their political will by getting the people to want to change the government, or government realizes we better quit or I'll lose power. Every war today is fought this way. Now, wars were fought like this before, but industri the Industrial Revolution made this paramount. This is how we fight today. The United States of America targets civilians when we fight wars. We don't say it. We say we're not purposely killing them, but we're doing things that we know will kill them. And we still do it. No, it doesn't mean that the people who are doing it is a horrific thing. That's one of the reasons why total war is the most awful thing ever invented by man. Because it justifies the murder of civilians. And once you logically make the jump to say, I must do whatever it takes to win the war, so civilians become target. Once technology changes, what can you do? Think about the 20th century. Huh? Bombing them in the air, using poison gas. 
Again, chemical weapons, biological weapons, nuclear weapons. It's all open now, isn't it? And what's the justification? What is the scary, rational thought? We can join the war. Does it work? Eh, sometimes, sometimes it doesn't, but everybody adopts it. So, for example, in 2003, in your lifetime, the United States invaded Iraq. Some of the most important targets were uh, water sanitation facilities, sanit or water cleaning facilities, sanitation facilities, hospitals, schools, food storages, water and civilian suffer. And those are also residential areas, and those civilians would die when they did it. Well, they can purposely target civilians, but the unit are going to kill them. Why to end the war? Total war is horrible. The term would come out of World War I, but it's today. It's a scary rationale. And let's be clear about it. They're not insane. They're not just targeting civilians because they're crazy. Well, let me rephrase that. There might be some people crazy, but there is a rationality for it. And that's what makes it so scary. Smart, intelligent people are going to be capable of rationalizing horrible things. And say we had no choice. Now, it doesn't work the way they think. It never does. But, got to win the war. That's why it gets so horrible. Think what I just said? Oh, yeah, okay, I guess you got to win the war. What? It's pretty scary. That's Sherman in Latin. What Sherman said is this I'm going to take the war of the people, and I'm going to show them that war is all hell. Later on, it come, you ever heard of the term war is hell? It would take out the all part. Now, war as hell, actually, is not quite what he said, but he's going to show them this is how bad it is to the people back home. Basically, what he's saying is, the longer you fight, Sherman's coming. Sherman's coming. So what they're going to do is going to be called the March to the Sea. The March to the Sea. Don't worry about the bombers. The March to the Sea. That's Atlanta after Sherman left. The Confederates accidentally burnt down a big hunk of Atlanta when they are trying to leave. Sherman had his men finish the job. And what the plan was, he would take two-thirds of his army, live off the land, so abandon their supply line, and cut a swath of anywhere up to 80 miles wide through Georgia, destroying anything of military value. So railroads, public buildings, storehouses. Well, what's a, what could be used for the military? Anyone want to help me? Farms, animals. How about a better question? What can't be used for the military? <laughs> yeah, so basically destroy everything. And if farmers resisted giving the uh, uh, Union soldiers food, because they're going to live off the land, take it from them, they burn their farms down too. And that was the plan. To march from Atlanta to Savannah, Georgia. Total war. Marching through Georgia. And let me get to this. These would pretty soon be, yeah. So, like, they weren't even, like, fighting for, like, the South, for, like, the country. They were just, like, fighting to, like, the country. Yeah. Because it's, the Confederates were out of men there. So they had no resistance for the most part. That's just a line of devastation. Yeah. Did any of the civilians, like, fight back? A few. And they were good piece. Yeah. You know, this is, these are crack troops. Yeah. Not gonna, and, but even if you like try to hide your food from them, they burn your house up. Now I know this is going to cause problems. This obviously is going to cause some resentment. In fact, if you go to these towns along the path of Sherman's march, when they rebuild the town after the war, every courthouse in every town, every city hall, the front the front doors face the fire these south. We'll show you. And don't go down there and say, "Hey, go up on the stage for old Georgia and say, God, you're that William Thomas Sherman wasn't a bad guy." <laughs> I'm not making that up. My brother was a professor for three years at Georgia Southern University. And when he was there, he was basically told that we don't like Sherman down here. <laughs> you weren't even talking about him. Just kind of, you're a northerner, I'm just going to let you know. So you had to put away a statue of Sherman. That's what I said. <laughs> now he's at Ohio State University, and that's where Sherman was from. It's Columbus. I think that's kind of fun. <laughs> so statues out front. Well, we, they called these uh, chimneys that were all the left of the houses and the buildings they burned down became Sherman's tombstones. Clever name, huh? 
And then to the rail, they took special care to destroy the railroad so they could never be used again. They called those Sherman's neckties. And what they would do is they would take the rails, they would put the rails over ties, light the ties on fire so they get super hot in the middle, then bend them around a tree. So like around the back of necktie, trains can't use those. Did you, did you know that about trains? See, trains don't like to make 90 degree turns like that. <laughs> they like to go straight. So they can't rebuild the trains. Because you, know, you take the rails off and just leave them there. They just put them back on. Devastation. The day before Christmas, they arrived. Savannah fell with a short fight. And there's the cartoon version of Chester the Crab. I know you wanted a cartoon, right? There's the crab. There's Sherman. There's Santa. And that's what he presented. He sent word to Lincoln the next day. I present to you my Christmas present. My Christmas present. The city of Savannah. Then, there's Christmas. Yay. And that's way of soldiers. Next, they move into South Carolina. And in South Carolina, they destroy it. They thought Atlanta or Georgia was bad. Why did they take such special care to devastate South Carolina? City? The heart of secession. Yeah. And the plan was eventually to go up to Petersburg. And at Petersburg, everything was falling apart for the Confederates. They're out of men. By February, a thousand Confederates are deserting every night. They say the average weight of a Confederate soldier at the Petersburg line going into 1865 was 118 pounds. The average weight of a Union soldier was 143, they say, so they weren't a heck of a lot better. They were reduced to eating corn cobs. They would grind the corn cobs up into a flour and make kind of a moldy bread out of it. In fact, it got so bad they started adding sawdust to it, sometimes sand. Now that would do tor horrible things to your stomach, but at least make your stomach feel full. Because when you're really, you know, that just hurts. That's why they were just falling apart. And finally on April 2nd, Meade's army finally was able to cut off the last supply line. And don't worry about that, the Confederate line collapsed. And when it collapsed, it collapsed fast. I mean, fast, it collapsed. Those are Confederates surrendering afterwards. And when, when Petersburg collapsed, Richmond had to fall too. It happened really fast. I mean, that night, just a panicky retreat. The next day, here's a picture of one of the trenches, and that is a young Confederate soldier who died. Hard to tell his age, you know, being out in, in the elements, but he looks very young and very gaunt, even after he's kind of bloating a little. Richmond would fall, and when the Confederates were retreating in their haste to burn old to burn important documents so they wouldn't fall into Union hands, they burned their town down. A, an arsenal caught fire and see all those cannonballs. It blew the cannonball all over a part of town. Lincoln rode into town the day after it fell. Did you the yeah, the Confederates accidentally burned down Richmond too. Oh, yeah. Well, they sort of burned down what, like old documents in case they couldn't take with them, and the fire quickly spread. Same thing happened to Atlanta. It just well, Abraham Lincoln was new and then was near, and he rode into Richmond just the day after it fell with only twelve men, cavalry escort, and him riding in. In fact, they were black soldiers, a colored regiment, which seemed very appropriate, and he was met by thousands. Of former slaves. There's a painting, a drawing of it. And they were, he, he knew what he did, but he never realized the impact of the actions of this war. He would say the next day that this was the most important thing he has done in his life. He had less a week than a week to live. Lee is running away as fast as he can. And the last thing for today, as he runs to the west, he's finally cut off right here by cavalry under. George Armstrong Custer at Appomattox Courthouse. And there Lee would surrender. Wilmer McLean, I mentioned him in that video, he had a house at Manassas. A few shells went into his backyard and into his sun porch. 
We want to get away from the fighting. So we bought a little house in Appomattox Courthouse. So the war ended, or sorry, sorry, the war began in his backyard and ended in his front parlor because that's where Lee surrendered to Grant. Small country, huh? Wilmer McClain. Surrendered there, Grant gave Lee very lenient surrender terms and food. His men were literally starving to death. One more thing I do want to tell you. At the surrender ceremony, Grant had Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Remember the hero of Gettysburg, the 20th Maine? He accepted the surrender. We'll finish the rest of this tomorrow. Chamberlain, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll finish you tomorrow. I hope we get that for the bell. Some people distracted me. Yeah, a giant crow. Yeah, thank you for bringing the crow. And by the way, don't mess with crows. They never forget. Did you tell me, dude? I want to have a chat. I'm sorry. Yes, I am. You're such a nice person. I have I have a lot of I I have a lot of I have a lot of I have I we didn't limbo, I'm sorry. Okay. I'll limbo. Tomorrow we'll limbo, I promise. Back to the librarian.